When it comes to electricity in AP Physics C, one equation that's vital to understand is Gauss's law. Now, before we take a look at the equation itself, we need to take a look at a concept known as electric flux, which is the surface integral of the dot product between the electric field and surface area. Essentially, electric flux measures the strength of an electric field penetrating through a surface. This concept of electric flux leads us to Gauss's law, that the electric flux over a closed surface equals the charge enclosed by that surface, divided by a constant known as the permittivity of free space. Now, before applying this equation to some common situations, it's important that we take a look at each component carefully, starting first with the flux integral. The loop over the integral sign indicates that the surface we choose to apply Gauss's law to, or what's known as our Gaussian surface, must be closed, or have a distinct inside and outside to it. Another interesting thing about the flux formula we see is that it involves the dot product between two vectors, electric field and area. And while the E or electric field vector is quite self-explanatory, the area vector is actually the vector with magnitude A, or the area of your shape, with a direction that can be calculated through the right hand rule, curling your fingers around the area loop with your thumb pointing in the direction of A. When using the right hand rule in any future electricity or magnetism problem, it's vital that you use your right hand, as the left hand will produce the opposite and incorrect answer. And if you can't tell your left hand from your right hand apart, then honestly, I don't know how to help you. For any Gauss's law question you may encounter, there's a simple three-step process to solving for the electric field due to a charge distribution. First, determine what type of symmetry the charge distribution has, and draw the most convenient Gaussian surface based on that geometry. Second, calculate the charge enclosed in terms of the givens of the problem, as well as the dimensions of the Gaussian surface you drew, which you may have to make up some variables for. Third, utilizing the symmetries of your surface, solve for the electric field, making sure to consider properties of conductors and the flux calculations mentioned previously. Let's see this process in action, with some common charge distributions you may see, starting first with a uniform infinite line of charge with linear charge density lambda. To begin, the charge distribution is uniform and infinite along an axis, meaning that the electric field will intuitively point radially away from this axis. Because of this, a great Gaussian surface to choose would be a cylinder with an axis that lies on this line of charge, with length and radius that we'll call L and R for now. For step two, the charge enclosed by our cylinder is simply the linear charge density lambda times the length of our cylinder L. Finally, to calculate our electric field, let's look at the total flux through our closed cylinder. Because we know that the electric field must point radially away from our axis, the lateral surface area flux calculation can simply be reduced to E times A, or E times 2 pi RL, as our E and A vectors will always align parallel. For the two caps of our cylinder, the electric flux is actually zero through them, as the electric field vector and A vectors will be perpendicular so their dot product will become zero. Finally, putting all these components together and noticing that our length of the cylinder actually cancels out, we can simply solve for the electric field due to an infinite line of uniform charge. Now, another common geometry you may see is an infinite plane of charge with uniform surface density sigma. The process for finding this electric field is almost identical to our previous question. First, we can predict that the electric field lines will point normally, or perpendicularly, away from the surface, making a rectangular prism with top and bottom areas that we'll call A, and height that we'll call H, a great Gaussian surface choice. The charge, once again, is not too hard to find. It's just the density, sigma, times the area of the face of our box, A. Looking at the flux, we can notice that all lateral sides of our box will, once again, have a perpendicular E and A vectors, making the flux through them zero. The only faces where electric field lines would penetrate would be the two top and bottom faces, making our total flux E times 2A. Simplifying and seeing our made up variables A and H cancel or disappear once again, we can solve for the electric field due to a uniform infinite plane of charge. One final charge distribution you may see is an insulating sphere with charge density rho and radius big R. However, let's make things a little more interesting by making the charge density change linearly with radius, or that rho equals some constant k times the variable radius small r. More importantly, let's take a look at the electric field both inside and outside of this sphere. For the inside of the sphere, the symmetry is quite logically spherical, so let's make our Gaussian surface a sphere of radius small r. However, calculating the enclosed charge requires a bit more work this time, as the charge is not uniformly distributed over a surface or line. Instead, at any given radius lowercase r, we can find the enclosed charge by integrating the density function as a function of r over our total volume. From there, we can simply solve for the electric field inside of the sphere. Making use of the symmetries, we can simplify our flux equation and solve for the electric field inside of a sphere of charge. The electric field outside of the sphere can be found in a near identical way. 
The only difference is that for spherical Gaussian surfaces with radii greater than the radius of our charge sphere, big R, the charge enclosed is actually constant regardless of our surface choice. Like the inside, the charge enclosed in this sphere can be found through integration, only this time integrating over the entire sphere's radius. Using the exact same process, we can arrive at our electric field for the outside of a sphere of charge. While these problems may seem complicated at first, using this simple three-step process will make all of these geometries much simpler. Sure, for complicated, non-symmetric shapes, the equations can get really messy, but you won't be seeing any of those on your AP Physics C tests. For now, you can feel good that you've just learned about Gauss's law and its most common applications.